50 vehicles moving through the night like a small army. A traveling circus is coming to town. Within three hours of giving a show, the whole circus has been taken apart, packed into lorries, and transported to a new site. Continually on the move, from town to town, at some sites only staying a couple of nights and then moving on. At others, they might well stay for a week or two and get good audiences all the time. Every time you move, the caravans are there, the tents there, and every place looks the same. You move so much, sometimes you forget where you are. One field's the same as another field. Circus boss Jerry Cottle. If the circus is a dying art, then someone's forgotten to tell Jerry Cottle. For a combination of brash showmanship and a real love for the traditional circus is sweeping his show up from nothing into the big time. And though his circus may not be the biggest, as far as he's concerned, it's certainly the best. Magic transformation down on the old village green. Bright lights, big top presentation, like nothing you've ever seen. But have you seen the wide eyed wonder shining in the eyes of a child? Have you seen the wide eyed wonder? Stay gaze at the beast from the wild. The lights go down on the soda. The crowd is all round the ring. There's a sense of excitement rising. The circus is about to begin. Well, have you seen the wide-eyed wonder? The man walks across the wire. Have you seen the wide-eyed wonder? When the red skin eats the fire. Jugglers, fire eaters, clowns, in fact, all the men in the circus help put up the big top. They are a mixture of nationalities that would rarely be seen working together outside the circus. For most of them, their race and their religion has become the circus. We usually move about 50 times during a year. In terms of work, that's a hell of a lot of sheer muscle power. It's damned hard work. You, you don't work overtime. Well, you do work overtime, but you don't get paid for it. <laughs> You work like nothing on earth, and, um, and yet you feel sort of, you've got something out of it at the end. Not money, but it's, uh, never mind. <laughs> they travel all over the country, moving from town to town. Big Top is either going up, or else it's coming right down. Well, have you seen the wide-eyed wonder? The children watch the clown. Have you seen the wide-eyed wonder? When the circus comes to town. Everything has been worked out for speed and efficiency. The bandstand is a trailer. Move back the flaps and panels, and it's ready. Even the elephants seem to know what's expected of them. As much as is possible, all the pieces of equipment are lightweight so they can be handled easily. <laughs> the seating fits together rather like parts in a giant Meccano set. It's 
took me three months to learn to walk the stilts. And the reason I stay up here is because I, I don't fancy the idea of falling off. It hurts when you hit the ground. <laughs> and the only other thing I'm frightened of, woodworm. <laughs> When I first started, I only had a small tent, one lorry and two ponies. Four of us did the whole show and everything else, and we toured Devon and Cornwall doing one and two day stands. I've been lucky, in just five years, we've now got a tent that seats over 2,000 people and a really first class show. You may not believe it, but I did what every small boy wants to do. I ran away from home and joined the circus. I learned to work as a clown, a juggler, a steel walker, but all the time I only had one ambition, and that was to start my own circus. Once the big top's up, the circus settles down to its everyday routine. The bed of nails gets a coat of paint. The betting boys study form. The whole place becomes alive with circus children. Children who get their education in short spells at schools all over the country. And all the time, in the background, the steady throb of the generators. We use an enormous amount of power. We not only have to light both the inside and outside of the ring, we have to light the foyer, the stables, the artist caravans, and all the other vehicles in the circus. In a changing world, the circus remains much as it has always been as it was when our fathers were young and our great-grandfathers before them. In its time, it has been described as the greatest, grandest and most magnificent show ever presented to human eyes. The whole world within a ring. The greatest show on earth. The circus was never noted for restraint. But it is true that the circus has always presented an amazing collection of physical feats by both man and beast, the like of which you cannot see elsewhere. from Huddersfield. The circus is part-time artist and full-time extrovert. I paint every flipping vehicle on this circus and a couple of other circuses besides. I don't need an exhibition, it's all there for anybody to see. And everybody comes and looks at it, the circus fans think it's marvellous, I think it's blooming horrible. <laughs> his paintings also decorate the inside of his own caravan. And his choice of books reveals a lively interest in the occult. I try out new ideas on the missus before I do them in front of the public. She thinks I'm a bit of a nut. I suppose you've got to be to be in this business, you know. <laughs> in his time, he's been a man of many parts. Well, between eating electric light bulbs and nuts and bolts and fire, you know, my teeth just went for a burden. I was eating razor blades in them days as well. You can't eat the modern ones, they're uh, stainless steel, they just bend sort of thing and cut your mouth to ribbons. The old ones used to be able to crunch them and... <laughs> delicious. 
It's all in the mind. Mind over matter. I need the money, so I don't mind, so it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> well, I practiced this first wearing all my clothes, and I, I got down to my shirt and tried it a couple of times with that, and then uh, went straight in the shower with nothing on, apart from my skirt, you know. <laughs> but you've got to be very, very careful you don't move sideways. If, you, uh, if you're sliding it or anything like you, that, you uh, end up sort of with a nice slice across the middle. Most people don't believe they're sharp, you know. You just can't get the audience to believe they're sharp. They are. Anybody who wants to try it, you know, can help themselves <laughs> at their own peril. His piece de resistance, lying on a bed of swords with a bed of nails on top and a young lady on top of that. Barry claims the world record for lying on a bed of nails, 32 hours. He's teaching his eight-year-old son, Tony, the tricks of the trade. The nails are for real, and Tony will eventually graduate from his one-inch apart bed to a two-inch, just like that. Barry Walls, alias El Hakim, is also the far-eating Red Indian Otaki. The first thing you do is uh, get a flame, stick it in your mouth. I saw this fire eater and I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. And a week later, I was doing it. Minus my lips down here, you know. I... Now I end up with some blisters. Uh, a couple of years later, when I went in the Air Force, uh, I decided to try and blow fire. Marvelous experience, aviation gasoline. Blow it out, light it up, and bang, the loss exploded in my face. <laughs> if I'd have tried it again, any time within that 24 hours, I'd have been able to do it. But I didn't, and I lost my nerve for six years. Never did it again for six years. Now I do it as a matter of course. Providing I don't swallow the fuel, I'm all right. It's always a bit risky, though. You can always get a blow back or set something alight. It's a living, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Sidney Howes, the world's oldest working lion trainer. In a lifetime of working with wild animals, Captain House has had his share of nasty moments. You've got to be ready for the unexpected once you're in that ring. Anything can go. I mean, I've had some nasty accidents. The same old line has had me twice in the mouth. And she had me twice. She had me in one leg one week, and a fortnight after, she had the other leg in the mouth. But when I shut that mouth, that jaw, it's like a vice. It's like a clamp going on your leg. Wild animal training has always been a dangerous job. There can surely be few men of Howe's age willing to risk life and limb twice a day in order to make a living. His wife, Jess, still, after all these years, refuses to watch his act. My wife, is, uh, she, well, never has watched me all my life. All that married years, she never watched me perform. She'll either come in the caravan and uh, put the radio full belts, or she just gets her bag and goes across the road to the shops or up the town for a walk. She's always had that fear. If I don't come back within a few minutes, what's gone wrong? I mean, my animals, you see, I face them. We don't have chairs or guns, no fire hydrants. So we, we go in there to the public to defy the beast of the jungle, and, and I try to give that impression. And that's why I work them that way, pretty fast and noisy. We've um, brought him up like a child. We dress him uh, when he messes, just like a baby, sort of changes his napkin, we change his little trousers, and we still do today. But he's coming up to 15 to 18 months now, but the animal's there, he's getting his teeth. But to me, he worships me, he wouldn't do a thing wrong. But anybody that approaches me, even my wife has to be careful, though she's brought him up, he'd turn on him. See, that's the animal coming out, which you can't stop. His caravan is filled with reminders of over 50 years of working with lions, tigers, elephants, chimpanzees, bears and leopards. You can train them, says Howes, but you can't tame them. Captain Sidney Howes, a great old man of the circus.
Khalil Ogav, mighty strong man from Persia. weight, held only by his teeth, and hit repeatedly with a sledgehammer, serves to warm the audience up for his more spectacular feats. The tow bar of a trailer becomes a useful piece of equipment for morning exercises. Lying on his back in the sawdust, he prepares to lift eight men on a plank. If he's in the mood, he'll lift ten. There is no circus as we know it in Persia, so for years Khalil performed alone in street markets, never failing to attract large crowds. He came to England only a year ago. A highly religious man of simple tastes, he lives with his wife and child in an old and battered caravan. Though he speaks little English, the gentle strong man from Iran has found in the English circus both a living and a home. His main ambition is to persuade Jerry Cottle to take his entire circus to Iran, where he is convinced it would be a sensation. The climax of his act, lifting a one-ton elephant four inches off the ground. Next year, he plans, as a fresh attraction, to have a double-decker bus drive across his chest. The James sisters, also known as the Anara sisters, artists of the high trapeze. Well, I suppose we lead two kind of lives, really. The housewife in the day, shopping, laundry, looking after the children, cooking. And then the four o'clock comes, the whistle blows, and then you've got to be made up, ready for the show. You leave all the worries of the day behind you, and it doesn't matter what you've worried about during the day with the children, etc. You've got you not to show it in the show, and you, that's when you become the artist. But people have said to us often, older circus people, that Barbara and I have got something special in our trapeze act, that. Um, that nobody could teach you. This is this combination of working together and the movement, which is natural instinct, you know, which we're very fortunate to have. It's a great gift. On freezing cold nights, we sort of hang back in the dressing room right until the last minute, although we have to be ready. Um, well, we always are ready, and at least an act before. Um, but we'd sort of dash out at the last moments through the cold into the back of the ring doors, and then we go into the ring looking like the Queen of Sheba, as it were. two shows a day, seven days a week, and sometimes even three shows on a Saturday, which is very hard going. And then we move that night sometimes and do very long journeys. People think when the show's over, that's the end of the circus that, to them. But it goes on almost another day for us, really. You wonder what you're doing it for, you know, sometimes, and you get very, very disheartened. And, um, but you seem to go on, something, the next place you get to, you just go on, you know, it's, it's a very hard life. I suppose that's the love you've got for the circus, really. So everybody understands, you know, um, what each other is going through, and, that, that, and you know that everybody's pulling their weight. It's one sort of um, happy family, you know, it has to be on a circus, else the circus wouldn't go on. Um, as I say, there's this thrilling circus you can't, one can't explain. But this is what makes you go on. I don't know whether it's the fresh place and the fresh audiences and, or what it is. You just can't explain, you know. The youngest 
clown in my circus is 17-year-old Matthew Ware. I suppose, in a way, I saw myself in him, so I decided to give him a try. I always wanted to be a clown. Uh, I came along and saw Jerry Cottle, and uh, he understood and gave me the chance. You know, it was a bit strange at first, but, you know, I've got used to it now. Matthew is learning the art of clowning from Cottle's chief clown, Tommy Tucker. Really speaking, the, the identity of the clown is something that the clown himself works on, because the clown is an actor. He's a performer performing in public. He, he's acting. Normally, it's an extension of one's own personality. The, the motley, the clown makeup, the face makeup, extends one's own features. If one has a naturally funny face, then you emphasize this with makeup. The character, likewise, normally, again, is an extension of one's own personality. Behind every clown's smiling face, there's a sad man. That may make a good plot for an opera, but has it any basis in fact? Or is it just another legend of the circus? Well, to a certain extent, it's true. Not an awful lot of um, funny men, sort of clowns, comedians, are happy-go-lucky, um, lovable sort of personalities in, in everyday life. The reason being, comedy is a serious business. You can quite easily go in front of the public and die. And there's nothing more embarrassing than go out there and have no laughs. But if you go out there and do five minutes with no laughs, it's not funny. So um, perhaps there is some basis in the story. You work with what you have. We have uh, a very good small clown, Little Bean. So therefore, we, we use Little Bean, and a lot of the comedy stems from his size. And for instance, the safe gag, he's a very small policeman. Now, if it was a bigger safe with a, a full-size man in there, it just wouldn't be funny. But the fact that it's a little fellow who's three foot too high comes charging out, blowing a whistle, that's the policeman, that's funny. Well, some comedy stems from accident, um, something that just happens, and, and we, we find it funny and keep it in. Or more so, uh, more importantly, the audience finds it funny. For instance, the, the drum uh, gag, the, the, the small clown bean, when he falls over it, it was a trip, and he actually did it once in front of the audience, and it got quite a big laugh. Uh, so obviously we kept it in. I think that the, the circus is the future. I, I think it's got a, bit, a big future, because to my... Um, mind, in my opinion, it's the only form of entertainment that's remained unchanged, completely unchanged over the years. It's the only form of entertainment that mum and dad can safely take the kids to nowadays without having to explain a smutty joke. It's, it's still good, clean family entertainment, and I think it's got a big future. Top of the bill, the Simaro brothers. Two young men from West Berlin with a truly remarkable high wire act done entirely without a safety net. We really never had any choice because it's a family tradition and we got born into a family of uh, circus artists and uh, ever since, uh, as long as I can remember, it's been this way and of course it became my ambition to be like my father was and uh, that was generally my drive, you know, as soon as I left school, as soon as I was finished through with my schooling, that was it for me. I didn't think of anything else because that was my ambition to become like my father. As you practice and all that, you get so confident in yourself with whatever you do that it literally doesn't make any difference anymore whether you do it on a little low wire one meter high or whether you do it a hundred meters high. The brothers never talk to each other during the performance, yet they know exactly what the other is doing and thinking. Over the years, they have brought their act to perfection. One brother, completely blindfolded, carries the other on his shoulders across the wire. The Simaros, a truly fantastic team.
many people find it surprising that the circus is still with us. How can a form of entertainment that has changed so little over the years still survive in this day and age? In fact, its survival and popularity are largely due to it remaining much as it has always been. The circus has its established place in the world of entertainment. Let us hope there will never be a final performance. For if it was to die, it would take with it that magic that is and has always been the circus. It's just a thrilling circus, you can't, one can't explain. But this is what makes you go on. I always wanted to be a clown. I did what every small boy wanted to do. I ran away from home and joined the circus. Variety is the spice of life, and that circus. I think the, the, the circus is the future. Uh, I think it's got a big, a big future. It's a living, I suppose. <laughs> You wonder what you're doing it for, you know, sometimes. It's a very hard life. I suppose that's the love you've got for the circus.